seen him perform before. I've seen him bring me up and out so many times. So I got a track record and a history with God that says whatever I need, his hand has already provided me. Because greater is he who lives in me than he that is in this world. Hallelujah. Thank you. 
lifted up. Because our Savior, Isaiah, reminded us is high and lifted up and he's still sitting on the throne. So Father God, we want to say thank you today. Thank you, O oh God, for the presence, for the person, and for the power of your Holy Spirit. But Father God, I want to thank you for the sovereignty of your Holy Spirit. That, that, that I can't get selfish and try to package up your Holy Spirit and keep it all to myself. But Lord, that, that you've allowed us to experience already this morning just a glimpse of what took place at Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit lighted upon the Lord and it was just a different experience. Father God, I want to thank you for the St. John Church family. Thank you for each member, name by name. Thank you for the members that are here today to just come and to lift up the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the visitors that you sent our way. We pray, oh God, that you would continue to bless them and, Lord, that you would meet every need that they may have. But Father God, in supplication I ask that you would bless and anoint every medical office today, every hospital today. As your people, oh God, we don't know who, we don't know when, we don't know where, but, but as they enter those places that they're already blessed, they've already been anointed, Lord, that, that your perfect will be done. So Father God, we enter those places not with the spirit of fear, but with love and with a sound mind, knowing that our God is able to do anything but fail. So Father God, we just say thank you today. Thank you for last night's lying down. I know we take it for granted, but thank you for waking us up this morning with your fingertip of love, oh God. Thank you for clothing us in our right mind, because Lord, there were alarm clocks that went off this morning, and people kept right on sleeping. There were loved ones that reached over and touched, Lord, and that other person did not awaken this morning, but in your mercy and your grace, you see fit to allow us to come out to the house of prayer one more time. So Lord, we're not here for show, we're not here for fashion. We came to praise your holy name, because you and you alone are worthy to be praised. Father God, you're worthy to be praised when we feel like it. You're worthy to be praised when we don't feel 
with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Final verse says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of our amazing God. We know that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. As always, with your prayerful consideration, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I want to preach a message today simply entitled, Reasons to Rejoice. We've got reasons to rejoice. As a matter of fact, when I thought about it, the fact of the matter is we've got a right to get our praise on, to celebrate and honor God. Uh, we have a responsibility to honor God, to serve God, and to love God. But then finally, we have so many reasons, a plethora of reasons, so many reasons that I can't even begin to talk about the number. The number is infinity. Amen. We've got so many reasons to rejoice. When pressure, pain, and problems are present, it is natural and human to feel concerned, feel frustrated, and allow the gravity of what we're faced with to consume our minds and weigh on our hearts. It's natural and it's human to become upset if someone agitates you. It's natural and it's human to become frustrated if things in your life aren't lining up and working out in your favor. Yes. It's natural and it's human to experience fatigue and weariness if you made an attempt, after attempt, to reconcile some broken relationship and for whatever reason, the other person fails to want to mend that relationship. It's natural and human to feel overwhelmed when the rough realities of life seem to grip and grab you and any effort to become free fails you. But people of God, in the midst of the difficulties, the trials, the challenges, and the troubles, the believer, we here today have been called to a lifestyle of rejoicing. I want to announce to someone that the joy the Christian, the joy that the Christian has, that is, is not based on agreeable circumstances. Instead, it is based on our relationship to God. Faith walkers like us will face trouble in this world, but we should rejoice in the trials we face because we know God is using those situations to improve our character. And this is the very exact reason why the half-brother of Jesus, the Apostle James, writes in his epistle to count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Brothers and sisters, the Apostle James and the Apostle Paul both share in the same sentiment that we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ have a biblical basis and a ministry mandate to make the deliberate decision and to make the conscious choice to choose to celebrate God and offer Him reasons to rejoice even in the midst of everything that is happening on the global frontier of our lives. The COVID-19 pandemic, brothers and sisters, did not catch God by surprise. This worldwide virus issue is not bigger than the healing power of God. This issue that we face as it relates to COVID is not bigger than our God. And God has never met a problem that can rival his divine authority. And it's my humble belief that in the sovereign mind of God, this crisis is simply an opportunity for those of us who prioritize the human trinity, me, myself, and I, over the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. 
This pandemic is a process that God is allowing to happen to draw us closer and allow us to fall deeper into fellowship with who he is. So brothers and sisters, I've come to a place in my life, in my mind, and in my heart that in spite and in light of what's going on in the world, I want to extend to God reasons to rejoice. I realize it might not be popular. I understand that it might not get likes and hearts on social media, but in the midst of this turmoil, I choose to trust and celebrate God. I'm trusting God because my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood But holy lean on Jesus' name because it's on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. I choose to celebrate God. I wonder do I have company in here right there. Because if you choose to celebrate God, you choose to rejoice in the midst of climactic issues, in the midst of trouble, in the midst of trials and challenges, you too can celebrate and say thank choose to commemorate. We got to choose to venerate. We got to choose to honor the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I refuse to give up. I refuse to give out. I refuse to complain, to grumble, and to pout. But on the contrary, I choose to say glory, hallelujah, thank you, awesome God, because I understand in my sanctified heart and mind that this too shall pass. Of God, the context of Paul's writing in this book, this beautiful book, this book written to the church at Philippi, just so happens to be one of the four letters that Paul wrote while he was inside of a Roman prison. Paul is in prison. He's chained to a Roman guard. But in light of that rough reality, he still finds reasons to rejoice in God by encouraging the church of Philippi in writing to them a thank you letter for the kindness they demonstrated toward him. You see, brothers and sisters, Paul had endured much suffering for the cause of Christ. And these trials had taught Paul to be content in all the circumstances, which is an ability that Paul used to encourage the Philippians to cultivate. In fact, this letter to the Philippians is a testimony to that very attitude. And even though he was in prison facing an uncertain future, Paul wrote this thank you letter to the Philippians, which is a letter that expresses Paul's abundant joy in what God was accomplishing through them. The most prominent theme of this epistle to the Philippians is joy, especially the especially the joy of serving Jesus. And the general tone of the letter reflects Paul's gratitude toward the Philippians and his joy in the Lord. That word rejoice, or the word joy, is mentioned some 16 times in these four short chapters. And so I feel it necessary for us to go ahead and dig in and engage these four preaching verses as the Holy Spirit seeks to give us clarity into the mind of God as it relates to making the deliberate decision to offer to God reasons to rejoice. The biblical text gives us reasons to rejoice firstly, number one, here it is, because it's a commandment. If you look at verse number four, that's what it is clearly. It helps us understand that we ought to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Paul says delight, take pleasure in the Lord always. Paul is giving encouragement and motivation to a church that is facing opposition from within and without. Under any and all circumstances, including suffering, the child of God has to learn how to celebrate and rejoice in the joy of the Lord. And I learned many years ago that the best commentary on scripture is scripture. So in order for us to gain a fuller understanding of this first verse, the Bible student is to parallel 
into another verse. And with that said, one of my favorite passages of scripture is Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse number 10 as it mentions in the last clause of that verse that the joy of the Lord is the believer's strength. In the prophecy of Habakkuk chapter 3 verses 17 through 19, the text says, though the fig tree does not bud, there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the field produce no food, though there are in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. And there's a beautiful, beautiful, y'all, praise and worship song that I like to offer to the Lord as much as I can. It says, you are my strength, yeah. strength like no other. Yeah. And your strength reaches to me in the fullness of your grace, in the power of your name. Here's what he does. He lifts me up. He lifts me up in the fullness of his grace and in the power of his name. He has this amazing ability, brothers and sisters, to lift us, to loose us, to liberate us, to set us free. Because whom the Son is, whom the Son says is free, he's free indeed. God has the ability to lift us up in the moments of weakness, in the moments of worry, and in the moments of hopelessness, God has this amazing ability to lift us up and to give us joy for our journey. Yes. I wonder, has he ever lifted you? Yes. Has he ever set you free? Have you ever been bound, shackled, chained? Have you ever had strongholds on your life as if you could not get free from whatever you got entangled in, but then out of seemingly nowhere, God came and set I'm grateful today because I enjoy this because the essence of what Paul is doing is he's offering firstly a command. What Paul is doing is he's in a real sense, he's saying this is non-negotiable. That there's no option as it relates to giving God a praise and honor. He says it's a commandment to rejoice in the Lord. Now, here's the thing. You could forego the command, choose not to rejoice, but the alternative is discouragement, defeat, worry, and having no hope. So to me, the better option is to simply obey the instruction and rejoice in the grace that the Lord imparts to every child of God. And just in case you missed the first call to rejoice, I like this, Paul reiterates what he initiates and says, again I say, rejoice. Y'all see that? He says we have reasons to rejoice because it's a commandment. But the second reason why we can rejoice today is because it confesses our character. It confesses our character. In the eighth clause of verse number five, it says, let your gentleness be known to all men. Brothers and sisters who love the Lord, the code, the conduct, and the character of the Christian is gentleness. And this is the very reason why Paul says, let your gentleness be known to all men. Gentleness draws and attracts people rather than hardness and roughness which repels people and pushes them away. You see, that's what it does. And, and I'm sure I'm not the only somebody that would much rather be around kind, loving, gentle people rather than mean who have no joy, who have no peace, who have no smile, who have no inner calmness, just mad because they're mad. If they get a bad, if they have, if they have an issue, they're just mad, just mad for no reason. Y'all know anybody like that? Just mad. Gentlemen, brothers and sisters, identifies a person who manifests a calmness and a fairness of spirit. A person who is gentle is willing to sacrifice his or, own, his or her own personal rights to show consideration to others. Paul, in this letter to the Church of Galatia, writes in Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse number 22, and then he also mentioned in verse number 23 that the fruit of the Spirit is 
love, it's joy, it's peace, it's long suffering, it's kindness, it's goodness, it's faithfulness, and here it is. It's gentleness. Again, at such or against such, there is no law. 